That's fine. Thank you very much and good afternoon. I hope you had as good an espresso as I've had, so you're, you're nice and awake. I want to begin, too, by thanking the organizers who have been very patient um, and have accompanied my journey here with incredible patience and uh, finesse, so thank you for making all this possible. I'm also probably one of the few Protestant speakers uh, for your conference, whatever Protestantism is. I've heard a number of interesting things as what Protestantism is supposed to be and what Protestants supposedly say and believe. Um, I, I can't, you know, either controvert or correct uh, all of these things, but uh, I'll, I'll do some of that perhaps in the, in the talk. What I'm interested in is Christian humanism, and which is how I'm going to approach this whole topic of work, since hence you have to see the title. Instead of talking about two competing paradigms on vocation, I'm interested in moving beyond competing paradigms and some sort of ecumenical effort on the topic of work. So, in my view, any Christian reflection on the concept of work as vocation must consider two aspects. The first is theological anthropology, and we've heard some of that already. We cannot think about the nature of work without pondering the question of human nature. Given that the central mystery of the Christian faith is God's becoming human for the restoration of our true humanity according to God's image, any reflections about work must, in the words of John Paul II, emphasize the primacy of human beings over things. The primacy of human beings over things. So thinking about vocation must be grounded in theological anthropology. What is human nature and how does our view of work accord with that nature? In the biblical tradition, as you well know, human nature is special by being created in God's image. The question of work is therefore inevitably linked to the question of human dignity and to the challenge of examining whether our modern view of work accords precisely with that human dignity. Only in this way can we decide between humane and dehumanizing in human work. After anthropology, the second aspect we must consider when thinking and reflecting about vocation and work is epistemology, how we know. We should remember that the very notion of work is intrinsic to human nature and dignity emerged only historically. They didn't fall from the sky, along with changing views of what constitutes a healthy society. Better? Thank you. This second level of reflection recognizes that humans only know by way of history, thus asking how Christian anthropology with its view of work has shaped human society and how it has in turn been shaped by cultural changes. So we necessarily have a rear view mirror perspective of historical developments and so we all engage our topic, the conceptual history of work from a present historical point of view as those who inhabit late modern forms of capitalist, consumerist societies. Thus our reflection on work has little choice but to engage Max Weber's historical study of religion and the rise of capitalism. And it is Weber, perhaps more than anyone else, whose historical analysis of vocation gives us these two competing paradigms to which our panel is dedicated. Weber thought that the Protestant Reformation with Luther's teaching of justification by faith in combination with certain tenets of English Calvinism created the acquisitive spirit of capitalism. And Weber's argument today survives in the claim that the Reformation indirectly or unintentionally contributed to modern consumerism through the separation of faith from social responsibility. So for the purpose of our discussion this afternoon, I want to challenge precisely this thesis by showing that the Christological foundation of Luther's theology makes social responsibility, in fact, intrinsic to faith. No nominalism there. The purpose of this challenge is to move our thinking about vocation beyond two competing paradigms toward an ecumenical effort to recover a common Christian view of work based on our being made in God's image. So I have three short, you know, five-minute uh, talks, uh, parts of my talk,
And the first thing I want to challenge this thesis that Luther separates faith from social responsibility um, and argue that instead we owe Luther the very redefinition of vocation that later Catholic social thought presupposes and works with. In a second short bit, I want to look at Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, who used Luther's theology to create his own, or to design his own version of Christian ethic responsibility during the Nazi era. So he saw something in Luther, precisely this intrinsic connection between faith and social responsibility. And then just, I'll end thirdly with a sentence on why I think we need to be ecumenical about this. So let's first talk about the Weber and Tawny thesis. Weber's thesis was that Luther's Reformation and especially English Calvinism theologically baptized wealth as a sign of God's electing grace and that the secularization of this belief ushers in modern capitalism. The first part, the first part of this thesis has turned out to be false. Already in the 1920s, Richard Tawney criticized Weber's misreading of 16th century Calvinism and Puritanism as an early version of an individualistic health and wealth gospel. Tawney argued that the early reformers and English Puritans by and large adhered to patristic and medieval notions of a Christian commonwealth in which avarice, usury, and excessive riches at the expense of others contradicted the philanthropy and liberality of God and was therefore sinful. It was not until much later, perhaps 200 years later, that economic interests became separated from Christian morality now, Tony's criticism of Weber has been eloquently restated by my co-panelist here, Dr. Gregory, in his work, The Unintended Reformation. Brad argues and agrees with Tony that Calvinists and Lutherans knew the Bible much better than to sanctify greed and avarice. According to Tony, then, the real question about religion and economic practices, the question that Weber did not answer, is what allowed for the radical change of this medieval attitude in the early reformers toward reconciling Christian belief with capitalism later on. And in contrast to Weber, Tawny rejects a simplistic explanation whereby a change in religious attitude directly caused a subsequent change in economic practices. He argues instead for the combined reciprocal influence of religious and economic factors. And then, on the religious part of this equation of these factors, Tony does, however, advance an argument that I think my colleague Brad Gregory here has also made his own in the unintended reformation. And that is, they both argue that Luther's teaching of justification by faith created the basic conditions for the rise of capitalism by denying that good moral works contribute anything to one's salvation. Moreover, by describing justification by faith as individual encounter between the soul and Christ, Luther allegedly, allegedly unhinges the sacramental mediation of grace through social structures. Tawny argued that Luther's separation of grace from any ecclesial or institutional mediation, I quote, destroyed the bridges between the world of spirit and of sense, end of quotation and thereby paving the way for a separation of the inner world of the soul nourished in the church and the external secular world outside. And Dr. Gregory similarly argues that by separating morality from salvation, thus by repudiating, I quote, teleological virtue ethics, Reformation theology unintentionally enabled the later modern separation of, I quote again, economics from public morality. So to sum up, Weber and Tawney have provided this classic argument that the Reformation gave rise to capitalism and secularism. The argument continues to persist in this unintended version where a particular teaching by Luther of justification by faith cut the vital cord between personal salvation and public morality and therefore was the indirect, unintended cause of consumerism. It's a problematic argument, as you, those of you who are married know. I try to tell my wife all the time that I'm indirectly responsible for a number of things, and she does not buy that. So I want to claim, on the contrary, that Luther's theology did not make this separation, even though some of his exaggerated statements on works righteousness can mislead a superficial reader of his works to believe that he did. Luther indeed taught that works do not contribute to one's standing with God. 
but this does not deny an organic living connection between faith and public life. It is important to correct this misunderstanding because this correction will allow us to see that Luther's understanding of vocation is actually fundamental to Catholic social teaching. So what is Luther's true view of vocation? And to answer this question, we must first look at Luther's Christology. Those who charge Luther with separating the Christian self from the world and social responsibility, and I could extend this argument uh, to the general argument that you know, there is a Protestant this, this separation of creation from faith and so on. Those who make this charge usually completely overlook Luther's Christology and the participatory sacramental unity of the human life resulting from this Christological center. We only have to revisit Luther's treatise on Christian freedom to demonstrate this oversight. Now, you may know that Tawny cites this piece of writing to prove the damaging influence of Luther's separation of salvation from works that abolished a more medieval, holistic worldview. A more careful reading of the same piece of writing shows, however, that Luther's Christology amounts to a unified, participatory view of faith that requires social responsibility, not on the basis of salvific merit, to be sure, but on the basis of union with Christ. Let me explain. It is true, of course, that Luther preaches justification through grace by faith alone. But justification for Luther is not merely an external cloak of righteousness thrown over an otherwise unchanged person, as Jacques Maritain would have it. Rather, justification grafts the Christian into Christ. For Luther, the soul is united with Christ as a bride to the bridegroom. This union, he says, I quote, is a sacrament in which Christ and the soul become one flesh." End of quotation. This union with Christ effects a real change in the Christian who now wants to serve God and neighbor, motivated through the experience of being loved by God. Clearly then, for Luther, justifying faith is neither merely forensic nor an individualistic concept that separates the Christian from wider social responsibilities. Luther describes justification as affecting the mystical union of the soul with Christ. This union with Christ cannot be individualistic, for Christ incorporates the believer into the body, into his body, the church. Nor can this union with Christ be private, because for Luther, the Christian participates with the church, his body, in the cosmic Christ, by whom creation is preserved through divine ordinances or mandates, that Luther came to define as the three states of politeia, that means society and politics, economia, marriage, family, work, and the economy, and ecclesia, the spiritual and institutional reality of the church. Now I have to, uh, I have to apologize. Normally the slides have sort of interaction, but they were saved differently, so this is all sort of a little bit different. All I wanted to point out is, look at this picture of uh, this depiction from 1488, where Christ is over all the three areas I just mentioned and gives them their commission. Yeah, you see the church, you see the magistrates, and you see the, basically the sort of farmer family uh, at the bottom. Now, it is difficult to convey Luther's teaching in a few sentences, but the main point should be clear. Luther's Christology requires us to abandon the claim that he radically separates salvation from virtue and thus puts in place a basic dualism that prohibits any intrinsic link between faith and public morality or social responsibility. Instead, Luther aims at this holistic, unified understanding of the Christian life within the various social spheres that are ideally all serving God's will for human flourishing toward a healthy society. Luther is able then to build his entire Christian ethics of social responsibility precisely on the doctrine of justification by faith because of the Christology. When God draws the believer by grace through faith into union with himself, the believer now participates through Christ in the new creation and therefore also bears responsibility for the world. 
As one Luther expert put it, and I quote, in being with Christ, the human being receives the dignity to share in the politia Christi, in a world hostile to God. The Christian becomes the cooperator, cum Deo, the basis for the Christian's worldly actions, our orientation toward one's neighbor, and the mandate to cooperate with God within creation. End of quotation. So indeed for Luther, life in all these social arenas, established as divine orders of preservation, including work, is part of our sanctification, of our Christ formation. As Oswald Bayer, the Lutheran theologian, has formulated Luther's social ethics, Christian discipleship for Luther is living a life of obedience to God that takes place in, I quote, the house of the world. So if we understand Luther's Christology, we can now turn back to his definition of vocation. And we've already heard some of this from uh, Professor Gregory, so I can cut this short a little bit. Luther develops his understanding of vocation within this Christologically grounded social responsibility. And foundational for Luther's understanding of vocation is his understanding of Christian freedom. And we see here the same dynamic. You may recall that Luther famously defined the Christian as at the same time, I quote, a perfectly free Lord, subject to none. Part of me always loves that statement. Perfectly free Lord, subject to none, because you're loved by God, justified before him. And a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all, both at the same time. Through their faith in Christ, believers are radically free and nobody's servant, but in their mystical union with Christ, on account of Christ's love for humanity, this freedom makes everyone into a priest, ministering God's will within society, oriented toward one's neighbor. With this teaching of universal Christian priesthood, Luther, as we've heard, abolishes with one fell swoop the difference between clergy and laity and lays the groundwork for a lot of developments later on, which is true. I'm more interested in how he views work at this point. For Luther, every work or profession is now ennobled as a divine calling. Work is joyful service for God and neighbor, meant to fulfill both the divine calling in Genesis to, I quote, work the garden for the sake of providing sustenance, but also to fulfill the divine mandate to take care of God's creation through work. And it is at this point that Luther's understanding of work links up to his understanding of divinely mandated orders for the preservation of creation that we've heard about. All work possesses the dignity in serving these divine mandates in all of the area of the economia. A housewife or maid working for, to support families, the farmer in providing food, the magistrate administering justice, the university professor teaching in a university, and so on. As Luther put it, then a poor servant girl could seriously have joy in her heart and say, now I cook, how can I be more blessed? It is just as if I wanted to cook for God in heaven. You can think of less patriarchal examples, but they, they exist. Luther's view of vocation had radical implications for feudal society, as we have heard. And so Luther has therefore contributed a great deal to our modern sense of this basic equal dignity of every profession. I want to move on to Dietrich Bonhoeffer now, who took on Luther's um, sense of vocation. Now, the context is interesting. Luther's bold identification of vocation and God's call can turn into a problem when one's profession becomes so identified with God's call that established social structures and state law become more sacred than following God's command to love one's neighbor. So Luther's caution that Christians should do what the magistrate commands, except when these commands sin, often went unheeded. The problem became especially clear and apparent in German history during the Nazi era when vocational loyalty to the state law and the nation conflicted with God's call to a common humanity in Christ. And Bonhoeffer, the Nazi resister, who as you well know was murdered by such loyal servants of the state for his political resistance, nevertheless insisted that Luther wasn't to blame, but 20th century Lutheranism or cultural Protestantism 
which Bonhoeffer called a pseudo-Lutheran distortion of the reformer's original meaning of vocation as discipleship. At the point of his death in prison, Bonhoeffer was writing an unfinished book on ethics which, in which he recovers Luther's Christology, his Christ-centered view of vocation, adding his own accents. Bonhoeffer, more strongly than Luther, emphasized the incarnation for the meaning of vocation. God's becoming human in Christ defines the reality in which the Christian work takes place. Christ's humanity, Bonhoeffer says, affirms creation. Christ's death judges its fall into sin, and Christ's resurrection establishes the new creation. Christians already take part in this new reality and live their lives in response to it. They live out this reality, however, this new humanity, in a fallen creation that is preserved by God through divinely mandated orders of preservation that will ultimately dissolve upon Christ's final return, but for now form the penultimate divinely sustained spheres of God's, of Christian activity in the world. So like Luther, Bonhoeffer names the church, marriage, the state, and work, including the work of culture, as divinely intended penultimate domains that enjoy relative autonomy, but are ultimately all oriented toward God. The Christian lives within this, then, in an eschatological tension of the penultimate orders of preservation and the ultimate reality of a new humanity out of which the Christian lives. And that is Bonhoeffer's basic view, or the basis for his view on vocation as discipleship. The discipleship consists of a, lived, of a life lived as response to God's call. And God calls each Christian in communion with himself into discipleship so that each person becomes transformed into Christ's likeness by reflecting God's own love for humanity. And this call of God meets each person within its or his or her particular sphere of work and influence within which the Christian then lives out this new creation established in Christ. Responding to God's call is precisely to live responsible within one's concrete place in society. Christ calls the Christian worker, according to Bonhoeffer, into the world to affirm and cultivate it, but this vocation also entails the responsibility of confronting manifestations of sinful structures with God's vision of humanity as revealed in Christ, the very basis for Bonhoeffer's political resistance. So we cannot in our jobs, because we participate in the reality of Christ, escape wider social responsibilities by hiding behind the excuse, oh, I'm just doing my job here in this limited sphere of activity. Bonhoeffer gives the example of a medical doctor, an example he knew well for his own father, was one of the most famous medical doctors in Berlin. Bonhoeffer says, in sitting at the bedside of a particular patient, the doctor has to keep in view not only the patient's life, but also the medical profession and society as a whole. In treating his patient, the doctor may have to consider, I quote, taking a public stance against a measure that poses a threat to medical science, to human life, or to science in general, end of quote. Vocation, says Bonhoeffer, is responsibility, and responsibility is the whole response of the whole person to reality as a whole. So for this reason, we have to carefully weigh our responsibilities and we cannot hide simply in our private sphere saying, I'm doing my job. Responsibility and vocation, Bonhoeffer insists, follows the call of Christ alone. So you can see that just like Luther, Bonhoeffer recognizes that a Christian view of vocation entails a critical tension. Following the call of Christ is neither identification of God and world nor the simplistic opposition. Because in Christ, God became human. Vocation is properly lived out in the human domain in a particular culture. But because in Christ, God became human. Discipleship as transformation into Christ likeness will always relativize one's vocational or cultural loyalties. That, of course, makes a Christian a dangerous citizen and not a Prussian servant. Moreover, as Bonhoeffer knew very well, while living in response to God's call should prompt us to humanize our work, we also know that human dignity derives ultimately not from our capacity to work, but from our relation to God. Certainly, work is always a form of human self-expression, or at least work should be a mirror of our creativity and freedom. 
Yet in contrast to, for example, a classic Marxist view, we've heard some of this again this morning, work cannot completely define our humanity. Irrespectable, um, the irrespectable worth of each person cannot depend on any human capacity, whether for work, creativity, rationality, or responsibility. Why not? Well, we need to be careful that lest we begin to evaluate social policies based on such principles and capacities and eliminate those from our society without these desired capacities. And Bonhoeffer witnessed just this horrible consequence in the Nazis' euthanasia program for those deemed a burden on German society. Bonhoeffer clearly saw that our sense of vocation must begin with human dignity as rooted in God alone, lest we have no language to articulate the dignity of the physical or mentally handicapped. So while work is indeed an expression of our humanity, work, to put it in Luther's language, cannot be what justifies the worth of a person or the right to existence, ultimately. The final measure for the worth of human life and the work that's derivative from it rests in God, in God's recognition of each human being. We see especially then in Bonhoeffer's thinking an approximation to what I would call an authentic and integral Christian humanism championed by modern Catholic social thought as best suited to ensure a proper understanding of vocation. The Christological affirmation of the secular that Luther set in motion and that Bonhoeffer advocates finds echoes in the integral humanism of people like Jacques Maritain, Henri de Lubac, Jean-Paul II, Pope Benedict XVI, and more recently, Pope Francis, all of whom talk about this humanism, Christian humanism. To use one more, the encyclical we've already referred to, in Laborum Exercens, John Paul emphasizes that human work is key. He says, I quote, probably the essential key to the whole social question, if we try to see that question from the point of view of man's good. This is where critics of Christian humanism cry, anthropocentrism, it's all man-centered stuff, don't do this, this is all going the wrong way. The difference, of course, to the Marxist view on this point is because God became a human being, retaining the transcendence that resides in that, we cannot make man himself the ultimate good, but we are only worth because we're in uh, God ultimately, because God knows us. <coughs> what makes work so central for social teaching, Bonifa argues, uh, sorry, John Paul argues, slight theological slip, <laughs> is the intrinsic connection of work to the personal dignity of human beings, to those who are made in God's image. According to John Paul, work as an expression of personal dignity is found in the scriptures in two places. I'll just say this very quickly. In the creation narrative, um, where the dignity of persons is stressed, and then secondly, in the gospel of work, and we've already heard this this morning. Now, the stuff in the creation narrative that John Paul mentions, Luther mentions in his Genesis commentary, more or less, and the gospel of work, of course, I would argue, is basically put in place, particularly in European culture, the dignity of every work as equal uh, in society and before God is also something, I'll be more brutal than um, my colleague Gregory, Brad Gregory was, it's only there because of the Reformation. Historically, that's just simply how it is. And so Catholic social teaching can make use of that and has rightly done so. So I just wonder why in all these encyclicals, uh, various popes, including, I mean, I'm a total Ratzinger fan because he's German and I'm German. <laughs> and also because he's a fantastic theologian. Why none of this definite Reformation influence really gets mentioned or acknowledged. So let's just say in summary, moving toward the conclusion here, that Luther and the Protestant Reformation have effected in Western cultures two things which have become part of Catholic social teaching the equal worth of different professions, and the personal dignity of every job. Luther's clear affirmation of work's spiritual value as service to God contributed decisively to imprinting to modern, on modern consciousness the dignity of work and of the worker. And I think this Christian view of vocation is something that Catholics and Protestants can and should affirm together. 
human work should correspond to our human nature as made in God's image, and that means in the image of Christ. Truly human work should be, therefore reflect the creativity, the relationality, and the generosity, the philanthropy of God. Work cannot merely be an enterprise for profit, and we've heard this, nor reducible to supplying physical needs, as important as those may be. Truly human work should reflect our being made in God's image by beginning in freedom and mirroring divine creativity and relationality. And I think that for our time, nothing is more vital in, in our context than the common effort of Protestant and Catholics to recover for our culture this sense of Christian humanist uh, calling that is, in, that is innate to the gospel because I think these, this kind of tradition is lost in our historical consciousness. And I want to throw in one last point for our discussion. I think one of the dangers that we need to combat together as Catholics and Protestants is the danger of technology. I think technology is probably one of the most subtle dangers of today in undermining our human sense of vocation as a human work and human vocation. Reformation and Catholic traditions emphasize that freedom, relationality, creativity, individual responsibility based on knowledge of the tradition are what make work truly human. And I think right now we are busy handing over precisely those things to the machines. Thank you very much. <laughs>